Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Joined by a very special guest, a Europa Conference League winning coach as well. Mark, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you, very well. All right, let's get straight into it. How did it come about, the move to West Ham a year ago? How did you end up joining West Ham? Um, David and I have been friends for a long while, obviously through football. I mean, initially I did that. I was involved in a, a tournament that Everton were keen to get into. And David Moyes allocated David Weir, who was on the Everton staff at the time. That's how David became David Weir became my number two at Brentford and Rangers and Forest, etc. That was that link. And then purely by chance, we, our families had vacationed at the same place in Florida for years and years. So my kids are going up and, and, and David, his wife, Pam, and myself and Liz, we um, uh, obviously knew them that way. I started playing some golf and then last summer... David asked for a couple of games of golf and, and this situation came up and he asked if I'd be interested in it. So that's really how it came about. That's interesting then because there was a lot of like rumours, if you like, in the West Ham world that because um, at the time you were sort of tipped to potentially become the new Birmingham City manager should the takeover happen. And David Sullivan was obviously linked to that in regards to potentially funding part of the takeover. So I think there was a potential theory that perhaps David Sullivan had become aware of your availability and then perhaps mentioned it to David Moyes, and that is how the employment came around. No, we, we knew each other, as I say, from the from playing over in Florida, and we had a chance to play golf, which you always grab. You don't get a chance, that chance very often. So we had a chance to game of golf and, and a follow-up, and, um, and that was the opportunity that David presented, and it was the one I wanted to take. Excellent. Right then, um, when you did your Sky Sports on Saturday, you were speaking about the differences between the clubs you'd been at and then the Premier League club as well. What was the, what was the biggest one that you noticed? Uh, without sounding too obvious, is financial. And and you're going to say that everyone strives for for the Premier League, the land of milk and honey, the, the, the wealth and the riches that come with the Premier League. But people don't realise... You, know, you have no idea that you can be in 20th place in the Premier League and there can be a team that on the ladder might be fifth in the championship. So just five places below you, it might as well be night and day, Joe, in terms of everything, travel to games, number of staff, support networks, game day. Game day, the, I remember the first, obviously the first game of the season was Man City. Um, and you look at what, what an event match day in the Premier League really is. You know, what it means, I'm, I don't want to state the obvious here. I hope people can read more than than what I'm just saying. Is, is you you walk up at the London Stadium, which is a magnificent football theatre, and then you see the amount of media interest around the world. You see what it means secured. Everything about the game and match day is so much bigger than the championship. And we are talking about, as I say, it could be a team four or five places lower. That's all in the structure. Um, but everything is so very different. And you understand fully why owners and supporters are so desperate to get to the land of Premier League because the, the immediate impression is so clear and so obvious and it is night and day. One signing I want to ask you about is Flynn Downs um, because, again, it's sort of West Ham conspiracy theory, if you like, because when you arrived and then the Flynn Downs looked like he was joining Crystal Palace and he came to West Ham and, and the people have had a theory, perhaps you recommended Flynn Downs to David Moyes or potentially of that ilk. Were you involved at all in persuading West Ham to go for uh, Flynn Downs? No, I think David Moyes, as a manager, you know, you'll always ask, and I'll do the same, I ask my staff about you know recruitment, set up targets for you and potential targets and you look at them, Flynn was a a player that we had played against many, many times. I, I like the fact that Finn has an edge to him. Um, young, uh, comfortable on the football, would benefit enormously from working with high-quality players or higher, like the, the likes of Declan and Lucas, etc. So when I asked my opinion, yeah, it was, a, it was a very positive. I like Flynn, I like him as a player, I like him as a person. Um, but it was all about the manager and the recruitment team and the rest of the staff as well. So everyone contributes in that type of process. Last summer, how sort of involved was, and I know you arrived during the summer, so perhaps it's a difficult question for you to answer. But one thing we as West Ham fans are always intrigued about is how West Ham go about player recruitment and how involved is David Moyes, how involved is David Sullivan. Obviously, we had Rob Newman involved as well. Would you say that Moyes has control over the incomings at West Ham? Yeah, David, he's the manager. You know, he picks the team. He has to be comfortable with the players that he picks. You're talking about a vastly experienced manager. You don't get a thousand games plus under your belt in, in this game without uh, acquiring a huge amount of quality and experience and, and knowledge along the way. So, absolutely, any manager has to be comfortable. At the moment, the manager just becomes a coach who is coaching the players brought in by the board, for example. That's a completely different role. And, and I think we can all see that 
Um, the Premier League, for example, are now appointing head coaches opposed to, as opposed to managers. So the game is certainly going in a, a different direction. But David is a you know long-standing manager, and he wants to manage a team of players that he that he knows how they can play and, and what they will do and how they will respond to his directions and instructions. So I've no doubt that David is in charge of that process. Now let's talk about you, Mike Warburton, at West Ham then, because this is a bit I'm interested in. Um, we got a bit of an insight from Kevin Nolan maybe about a month ago on Talk Sport when he sort of touched on sort of roles of coaches at West Ham United. What was your specific role or roles when you when you came to West Ham? I think it's it's fair to say. I mean, I, I said it on Saturday or whatever that interview may have been that David and I have different football philosophies, and there's nothing derogatory, disrespectful in that at all. I have a um, my team's playing a certain way. David's team's obviously we've got a thousand games. They play in a very experienced and professional way. Um, I think we had different philosophies, and, and I think I was brought in for that reason, Joe. I was brought in to to give my my approach and my thoughts on key areas, and when we played opponents, how we might hurt them, etc. So um, my role was one of yes, you get coaching. Obviously, David's a manager; he's very hands on. I'm very hands on as a manager in terms of coaching, but David's very hands on. Good, really good staff, the likes of Billy McKinley, but Paul Nevin, these are outstanding coaches. Kevin Nolan, of course, Javi is an outstanding goalkeeping coach, one of the very best I've I've come across, if not the best goalkeeping coach. So some really good staff on board. Um, there's no specific role that you would do A, B and C. It's not as if you're told, you know, you will take the sessions on a Tuesday and a Thursday or you will do this work. It's not so much that. It's a bit more, I'm going to say off the cuff in a bad way, it's a bit more on the day, decided what we'll do. But I think it's contributing on the training pitch and off the pitch. So when we have an opponent, what's our thoughts? How do we analyse? How do we prepare for them? How do we hurt them? How do we stop them? All, all the various things you would know as a supporter. You do it yourself in a pub over a pint, I'm sure. Uh, it's, a, it's the same thing, just in more detail. So I think it was, it was very much a case of a role of bringing my ideas of the game, philosophy on the game, to the club and hoping it could add some some quality to what already existed. One um, thing that I say we as fans have got a theory about, it's been spoken about by various people at West Ham United, in particular Mikel Antonio as well, in regards to sort of changing tactics halfway through the season or reverting back, if you like, to what, you know, at the start of the season, it felt like we got told there was going to be a transition at West Ham. You've alluded to it that part of the reason you brought in with your philosophy because um, me as a fan of football, your teams were more slower build up, a bit more possession based. You, you like the ball on deck and getting it moving and stuff like that. Um, I've seen a bit of your Brentford and I've seen a lot of your Rangers. Um, so I thought when you were recruited, I thought, well, this makes sense then. We're getting told about transition. So to bring on a coach that's perhaps different to how we've been playing makes sense. Um, and then the first half of the season, whether it worked or not, is up for debate. But in the second half of the season, it felt like at some point a switch was flicked and it was like, right, let's go back to what we used to do. And Antonio in particular has spoken about reverting back to those tactics. Was that the case? Was there any point where it was sort of like, let's change what we're doing tactically. Let's go back to what worked for West Ham in the previous two seasons with a bit more sitting deeper, a bit more counter-attacking football, moving Paqueta sl- uh, deeper in the pitch in some regards as well? No, I, I wouldn't say there was a moment at all in that respect. And I guess I love the fact that fans have their theories. That's what the, that's ah, a beauty, we do. That's the beauty of the game. That's the, that's the pub talk or the, you know, the social media talk. I get that. Um, I think there's, there's many aspects that fans need to look at as well. I think the recruitment last year, the club secured some high-quality individuals. Um, obviously, you've already mentioned Lucas. You're, you're signing a regular starter for Brazil to come into the football team. You're signing Morocco's left foot centre half who can play left or right. In fact, played on the right side in the World Cup and looked like a Rolls Royce of a player. You're signing Tilo Kera, who's 30 odd cap for Germany, 30 million pound move to PSG. You're signing Emerson and, and so on. And, and you're signing Jan Lucas Kamaka, who scores, I think, 16 goals in Serie A from one of the, the smaller, lesser teams. For, you know, no lack of respect. So the recruitment was was um, wide ranging. You know, the manager Rob Newman deserves a lot of credit for the, the, the going out and and all the staff supporting it, and obviously the chairman for for backing it financially. I think what the the key is, Gio, is how long players take to adapt to the Premier League. And people say, oh, I hear some, one fan said to me, they pay a lot of money, they should adapt straight away. You can't. The, the Premier League is that unique animal. Think back to your first question. What's so different? 
Um, I'm not digressing here. I'll come back to your question. Someone asked me at the weekend, like I did a conference at the weekend, and someone said, oh, you know, what's the difference? Well, you look at Leeds United in the championship, for example, and if I asked you for your first impression of under, under Mark Bielsa as a you know, hugely respected coach, outstanding coach, you would say to me, they run so hard. They steamrolled teams. That's what everyone tells me. Leeds United was so fit. The documentary, they run, they run, they run. Never had a day off. They steamrolled teams. You come to the Premier League, you don't steamroll teams because everyone's a thoroughbred athlete. You know, you look at Declan, you look at Thomas Suchet, you look at all Jow, you look at all these players and all the teams. Look at the distances and the physicality. You know, you have six foot three thoroughbreds. So... That side of it is, 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 you know, is adapting to that, that every single, every single game in the Premier League is an event. When you have recruitment on the, scale, on the scale that West Ham had and the different types of players coming in, and then you had the injuries, you had the World Cup break, you, know, you lose Naya for Ibrox after 10 minutes to look what the innocuous injury out for, was it three, four months? So we had no centre-halves for however long. All of these things, you've got players adapting to the Premier League. And I think that's one of the big things for West Ham for the first for the first four, five, six months is players adapting, you know, and, and the expectation from fans, quite rightly, would be high because you spent good money on high quality players. You know, you've got a really good look at the look at the likes of Deck and Cresswell and Mickey Antonio and Jared Bowen and Side Ben Marm and Kurt Zuma. And you know, if I missed anyone out, Vlad, an outstanding professional Vladimir you know. Kufau, you look at Thomas Suchet, and I've missed anyone out. There's no intention to goalkeepers wise. You know, you you look at superb from Lucas. You look at at, at Alphonse coming in. So the squad is strong, but as I say, the the key you when you look at your centre half, centre midfield, and up top, that's the spine of a team that you're looking to uh, mould, bring in, get used to the Premier League. And I think sometimes it takes so long. You look at the players, at other clubs, and you say he he didn't show last year, and look at him this year. And you hear it time and time again. And when it happens to your club, we tend to forget about it. I think coaches are guilty as well that these guys are... Look at Lucas in the last three months of the season. Look at the quality. The ball for the for the winning goal in the final should be enough to pay for the transfer fee, all joking apart. But you look at his quality and, and you look at Nayef and all, all those players coming in, supplementing the, the obvious quality that you already had here with Declan and Jared and Aaron and the rest of the team. Um, I think it's just a time, a, a, an aspect of time, Joe, yeah, more than anything else. So there was no switch being flicked. There was no major decision to, to revert back. But I think it's how, so I'm rambling on a little bit, but what I mean is teams regard, have a perception of different clubs. And the perception of West Ham outside is, oh, they're dangerous to set pieces. That's an obvious one. They're physical. Look at their set piece threat, you know, and they're a counter-attacking team. And every time I spoke to someone, be it in the media or a friend, it was like, oh, a great counter-attacking team, your set-piece threat. Every time you go in for a drink after a game, the opposition say, your set-pieces are so dangerous. Natural data was we hadn't scored many goals early on, but it's just that perception in football, Geo. So we were regarded as a counter-attacking team. So did we revert back to it? I think we always had, when you have a player like Mickey Antonio and Jazz with his pace and Saeed, you're going to be a counter-attacking team. It was the arrival of Gianluca probably, which changed things and we had to try and look to adapt so it's more, there's more aspects to it, I think, than just the obvious one that we, we, we flick to switch. Also, ramble on as much as you want. Everyone's tuned in to hear you, not me. They hear about me uh, every no, other day I, of the I, week. I don't want to talk nonsense, but I'm just trying to get the point across that such a big transition to the Premier League from anywhere else. It's huge. Yeah, but um, speaking of Antonio, um, what was your thoughts of his podcasts throughout the season? Um, some of them were obviously, didn't really say anything, but there was one or two which... I think caused controversy for West Ham. That one particularly just before the Conference League final as well. And obviously Moyes deflected away from it in the in the conference, as you'd expect. But essentially, you know, saying that Skamaka can't really won't possibly won't work at West Ham. Um and then he's talked about tactics throughout the season now and again as well. You speak about well, it was him that said that they, they reverted back and stuff. And it makes sense what you're saying from Skamaka and Antonio. You're going to have to play two different ways because they're two completely different types of striker. But what did you think of Antonio's comments? Honestly, I never listened to them. And that's not being rude to Mickey. I had a great relationship with Mickey. Um, you know, really enjoyed talking to him and watching him play, etc. But I don't listen to those things because you, you can get yourself lost and tied up. And I thought the manager dealt with that really well in terms of, as you say, you, you just, you know, straight back and, and deal with that type of question because it, it can become uh, awkward, for want of a better expression, 
but I think it was just dealt with. And listen, if Mickey's got a platform and the club are happy for Mickey to talk in that manner, well, then so be it. But me personally, Gio, I never listened to it. As a manager, um, you know, it's not obviously at West Ham, but you've, you've got QPR, Brentford, Rangers on your CV. Would you be okay with your player doing podcasts like that? Or would you prefer, call it a bit more old school, if you like, I don't mind calling it that, where it stays internally? Yeah, I think every manager's got a different way of doing it. And as I say, full of respect for David with a 1,000 games plus, which is a magnificent achievement. I keep saying that. Um, for me personally, I, I like to trust the players. I, but I'm very honest with the players at the start of the season, Gio, is that if there's anything put into the media which in any way is negative towards our squad, our club, our performance, then it won't be tolerated. That's my own personal way. Now, you can talk about the rise of social media and the rights of players, and they're so comfortable and so familiar on social media platforms. But I think at the end, the end of the day, they're, they're paid by the club. Um, I'm, I'm paid to manage that club, if, it's, if it's, that, that's the role I'm in. And I, I, I try to make that very clear. I'm not a shout and a scream and a baller. You just make it very clear to people. This is what's expected. You'd expect it of me. If I went in the media and said, player X is nowhere near good enough, I'm not going to pick him, you'd, you'd be up in arms. But how can it be all right for a player to do that? So, no, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very clear on that type of thing. And I think it's important that everything that is said in the media, Joe, is for the good of the club. And if there is an honest comment like that, then you guys jump all over it. I'm sure you will do. Two big competitions, obviously, Premier League, Conference League. Let's start with the Premier League. Did you ever worry about relegation, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You worry about relegation. I think every team, Premier League status has to be the overriding factor for any club. You know, let's think I'll go back to your earlier question. You can be three or four bases below 19th and you're in the, you're the top of the championship in a brutal league to get out of, an incredibly tough and difficult league to get out of. And that's just four or five bases below. So you've got to make sure, Joe, that Premier League status is your overriding concern. So did I have concerns? I did. I'm sure the manager, everyone did. Every fan did. Every player did. Because you have a responsibility. You're paid by the club to deliver a level of performance and to retain status and move the club where we all want it to be. And that goes for every single club in the divisions, re relevant divisions. So, yeah, very obvious concerns. And we had to make sure we deliver performances to get us out of that position. Uh, a potential interesting one, obviously, going back to the very start of the season, when you spoke to David Moyes, I assume there would have been a conversation in regards to the targets or the ambitions for West Ham's upcoming season. What were they? Uh, I think that's there's an obvious one. I'm always asked that, that one at, at, um, at previous clubs I've been at. And you know the size of a Rangers, for example, and the expectation there. So you always ask these questions. So... Let me try and answer it by saying, when I was at QPR and we came, I think we did eighth, eighth tie with Cardiff. I think we were, I can't remember what it was now. And uh, people said to me, what's your ambitions for the season? And I think our budget was down at like 16th or 17th. So some, some reporter, good guy said, I guess anything above 16th is, is a good season. And I said to him, how can you finish eighth or ninth and then have a fan accept 14th? It wouldn't. So I think the problem for West Ham is that I think the average finishing position for the last 10 years have been like 10th, 10.6 or something. And then suddenly you've had Europa League football. You're in Europe, 6th sixth and 7th. Sixth and, and they're two tremendous years by David, the staff and the players. Um, and now fans become greedy. I think that's fair to say that. I'm saying it in a very respectful way. They want more. They've experienced that. They loved European football. You got to you know Frankfurt in the semi-finals. I'm sure every single West Ham fan jail wanted more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll happily say I did. So there's no way, had the manager come out and gone, oh, well, you know, let's let's try and get the top half of the table, you'd be an uproar. So I think that there was no need to say what are the aims of the season. The aims are, of course, to finish as high as you possibly can and go as far as you possibly can in every single event, every single tournament uh, trophy. But you've got to appreciate the Premier League and you can be slightly off the fine margins of Premier League, Joe. You can slip, for example, from 8th to 15th like that, especially when the league was so tight. I think there's a situation where you win two games, we'd gone 10th from 8th, 17th. That's a ridiculous figure like that. So I think the targets are to... You, you've set a bar with the previous two years and it put a lot of pressure and expectation on the team and we, we knew we had to respond. Conference League win, though. Um, what was that like to be involved in the competition as a whole and then the final in Prague? For me, great learning curve, great learning experience in terms of, you know, I've, I've, I've spent my career in, in Scotland with Rangers and in the Championship, Brentford, Forest, QPR, etc. So all my experience in games have been in the league below. 
So to I'd never had European football. So to enjoy, to, to experience rather, you know, those type of games, the travel, the, the preparation, what is needed, etc. cetera, um, what works well when you're playing Thursday, Sunday. I was used to that from the, from the, uh, the championship. You know, it's just Tuesday, Saturday, Friday. It just never stops. So I was used to that side of it. But watching how the Premier League players, how they um, covered the loading, how they worked in terms of preparing for that Sunday game, often being a 12.30 or the early kickoff on a Sunday, which was bizarre, but it was. So how do we deal with that? That experience, going to some great grounds, of course, out mile and going there in the semis and the atmosphere and and then the final itself, Joe, which was just an absolute privilege to be involved in. And so, please, this, this is me stating the obvious, but you can't come into a club after just one year and go, oh, yeah, I'm West Ham through and through. No, I'm very privileged to have worked at West Ham for that season. Um but what I do know from my experience is that it, what it means to to diehard fans and players and what I knew what it meant to Deck and to Mark Noble, for example. I knew what it meant to the chef and to Joe in the canteen and, and the security guys and all these people. That's what it means to a West Ham through and through. So that that I get a lot of pleasure out of seeing that. You know, I saw when when Rangers got promoted or Brentford got what it means to the local fans. So I knew um, watching it there, watching the reaction after the after the final whistle. Um, watching the, the parade on the on the Thursday night, etc. What a magnificent day or experience for the club. Great achievement and one that I hope very much the fans will remember for a long, long time. Happy days. Love that. I absolutely love it. What did the did the conference league help with the Premier League in terms of like confidence, momentum? Because obviously we lost on a Saturday or Sunday in the Premier League. We then had a chance because we we well we won every game bar one in the conference league. So did that win on a Thursday actually have a knock-on effect where we had an advantage perhaps over relegation rivals because they would lose, they'd have a week to dwell on it and then go into the game with a loss behind them, whereas we'd have a Thursday game, get a win under our wings again and then go in on the Sunday. So while the fixture congestion was obviously difficult, but did the actual the confidence, was that an uplift that played its part? Yeah, it was, but your earlier question about relegation, that was always there. you know. And what I liked about this, this playing squad, I can't speak high enough, and it's not me having left the club, sitting here easily waxing lyrical about that. What a great squad of players uh, and some really good staff at the club, some really outstanding people at West Ham. Um, and I'm very sorry to leave them because, as I say, some really good people. And the squad knew the situation. Uh, and when, when clubs get relegated, one, no one ever wants to have a relegation on their CV, that's for sure. But the implications and the consequences of that, Gio, are... People, you know, 50% pay cuts, losing your jobs, you know. There's so many, there's so many negative implications to a relegation. Um, so the players knew that. Uh, and I was very, very impressed. Obviously, you know, Mark and his role as sport director did a great job there. But And, and it's obviously the likes of Declan, um, Jared, the senior pros, Crezzy, Aaron Creswell, superb professional. And all those guys had a real input. You know, they knew what they had to do because they knew what the consequences were. So that that never went away. So yes, it helped the winning games and European final and so much. Of course, that's there. But the the bread and butter that the key the key requirement was Premier League retention. Were you ever worried about the sack? And I say you, I mean collectively the coaching, or were you worried that David Moyes perhaps would get sacked? There was a lot of speculation, especially ahead of, for example, the Nottingham Forest game at home, that if we lost, Moyes may get the chop. Were you then worried that collectively that that could be it for your coaching team? You can't worry about that, Joe. You can't. Was it a, was it a thought? Yes, because the media as such and the demands and West Ham were, I think David won't mind me saying, we were underperforming as a, as a club in terms of league position. That's clear for everyone to see. We knew we were better than where we were in the actual league, but the league table doesn't lie. But you can't worry about things like that because out of your control, all you can do is go in every day. Um, and this sounds really corny, I apologise, but you just go in every day and be the best you can be. Yeah. As long as you go in every day, I don't care if you're driving a cab, building a brick wall, whatever you're doing, mowing the lawn, as long as you do the best you can do, then you can go home safe with the knowledge that you know I've given everything today. And I think there's that's what I say about the staff. I look at the staff. I look at the players, I look at the good people, everyone, the, the, the ground staff, Rush Green, superb, the canteen staff, outstanding, the security guys, the analysts, the medical, the, I don't miss anyone out. There's some really, really good people, media, outstanding, you know, Ian, Dan, all those guys, so good, um, M, etc. So, yes, you know, you're, well, you're well aware of all of, that, all of that side of it and don't ever lose sight of it. I think it's so, so important, Joe. 
Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that you departed West Ham through mutual consent. Um, when did you arrive at that decision? And I guess why um, is my biggest question. I think if I'm, I've got to be really, I want to be really careful what I say here for the for the right reasons. Um, I think if I'm 40, 45 years old and I'm really come out of a playing career and I'm really fortunate to be involved in football, I've got this chance. I just put my head down and I just keep quiet and go about. And if I'm told to, drop, to run, I run. If I'm told to jump, I jump and how high and all the old stories. But I'm a bit older than that. And I've got, you know, one of games as a manager and I managed some big clubs, been very privileged to manage some big clubs. I've also had a different career before that in the city where I was managing some desks and we had billions and billions of dollars go through us every day and responsibility. And I like that, Joe. I, I like, um, not in any arrogant way, I said that on Sky. Please don't think it's arrogant. I, it's just what what you're used to. I'm used to decision-making. I'm used to having to make decisions. I'm used to dealing with pressurised environments. I really enjoy that. I'm energised by that. And I just felt that, you know, um, our philosophies were different. That's why I came in, as I said. But I never wanted to get to the point with David where our friendship would be threatened because, you know, there was things that I'm saying, I, I want to do this. And he's the manager. And my job was always respectful and to be there to support him as manager, as all the staff will tell you the same. And the moment that I sensed that it was, I'd be driving out maybe and say, oh, I don't want to do that. I would have done this and I would have done that. I had to say to myself, you're not the manager, shut up, get on with it. That's what you're doing. But when it gets to the point where it's, it's bothering me too much and I don't feel that I'm adding the value, I always say in every job, um, if I can add value to the club, Gio, or to the association or the federate, wherever it may be, if I can add value, then I'm happy with that. If I can't add value, then I'm not happy. I need, I need to move on. I got to the point where I didn't think I was adding the, the value that I felt I could add, if that makes sense. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It was a case of I'd far rather have a man to man talk with David, maintain a really close friendship. I'm always on the end of the phone. He knows that. If I can ever help in any shape or form for West Ham with a player or a staff member or whatever, I would always happily do my best to help West Ham. But I felt it was the right thing to do, rightly or wrongly. Listen, I'm sitting here. Have I got anything lined up? No. Um, you don't want to be out of work in football. I feel I've got a lot to offer. I think I've got a good CV, but it was the right thing I felt to do at the right time. So I think I'm pleased I did it. I was going to ask that. What's next for Mark Warburton? I know you say you've got nothing lined up. Is there any hopes or aspirations? Yeah, I want to I want to add value to a, to a football club. Can I be a head coach, manager? Yes, I, I, I love it. I love that. But it's got to be having I mean, when you manage a club like Rangers or Brentford or QPR for three years and being at West Ham. Not in an arrogant way. I know that I'm a, I'm good at the job. I don't mean that in a bad way. It comes across poorly. I don't mean it to. Um, I know that I could have a lot more value than I was than I was was doing at West Ham. I want to be in a situation where I could add that value. Do chances come along in the UK? Right now, there's a trend to go for younger managers. Do you look at you know ex players, which is great. Experienced players coming out of the game into management, fantastic. But it means it's very very hard for the older managers. So. If I have to look overseas, I look overseas. You know, if I have to look at a sporting director role, which I've done before at Brentford and, and thoroughly enjoyed, then I'll, I'll happily do that. If it's a, if it's a different type of ambassador, not ambassador role, a um, association role, well then I do that if the opportunity. But I've got to a be lucky to get the opportunity, and then b I've got to show what I can do, and hopefully then I can add value and enjoy enjoy being employed in football because we're very, you're very privileged to be in the game. Uh, the last two questions for you. First of all, I've been thinking while you've been speaking with your answers, when you, you keep saying, you know, you have different philosophies, is that simply in regards to playing style or, or is there other philosophies and principles that you had that perhaps didn't align with David Moyes or was it just about football no, on the pitch? I think the idea was, and I'm sure David won't mind me saying this, that I was brought in because I have a more attacking type philosophy. You know, I look at the teams at, at Brentford, at Rangers, at QPR, of course, he said to be very attack-minded on the front foot. Uh, and that's why I was brought in. But also, he knows the Premier League so very well. You know, I'm not naive enough. David's got all those games and it's huge experience, Everton, Man U, et cetera, and West Ham in the Premier League and what it takes to win games of football in the Premier League. So there's a respect for me and the understanding and appreciation of that. But I think, yeah, there is that side of it, Gio. But also, as I say, when you've been a decision maker for so long, um, I think we both realised, I think he would he would find it impossible to be a number two. You know, he would find it totally impossible because he's so used to being a decision maker. And it's not said arrogantly. It's not said in that way. It's just said that, you know, what time are we training? What time are we reporting? Et cetera. And, you know, what's our schedule look like? What are we going to do today? We're, all these things, you just naturally do it. 
And I, I found myself, someone would say, like, what time are you reporting for I live in the airport? Oh, that's not my that's not my job. You know, it's that type of it was every day I was biting my tongue. So I think they would agree it's very, very difficult. If if I only had like 20 games as a manager, that's different. But I've got a large number and I've been very privileged to manage some big clubs. So that there's probably two sides to that, which I hope answers the question. Last question I ask every guest that's just, that comes on that's associated West Ham and that's worked with West Ham. Have you got any regrets? Um, any regrets? Great question. Um, regrets that, uh, yeah, I, I got, you know, as you do on social media, you get battered with fans saying, what are you doing? Get out of our club. You're doing nothing. And you, you want to say, listen, this is what I do. This is, what I, this is how I can add value. Regrets now, I think I've just got a lot of fond memories. Um, I'm very privileged to have been at a club like West Ham. There's no doubt about that. Should I have tried to stamp my thoughts more? Should I have maybe been more forward? I think you can say that, but talk is cheap. And I think the situation is such that you've got to do what you can to support the manager. That's what I'd explain. I had some great staff work for me. David Weir, magnificent. Now technical director of Brighton. What, an, what a gentleman, what an individual, what a knowledge of the game. John Eustace, now managing at Birmingham. But John was great. But they would challenge me, but they were always really respectful as well. Um, and I, I didn't. I would never want to be disrespectful. So yeah, I could maybe have been a bit, bit, bit more forthright, a bit more, you know, on the front foot in that respect. But no, no real regrets, Joe. Just a great privilege to have been at a club like West Ham in a year when they won a European trophy, and to have worked with those players as well, by the way. And have no doubt, there's some great players in that squad. And yes, whatever happens with Deck happens with Deck. Whether he stays, goes, that's not my business. But uh, there's no doubt that there's a really strong core of players out. I look forward to watching how they do next season. Well, Mark, thank you for everything you did for the club. Um, you arrived 12 months ago. You left with the winner's medal around your neck. Not every coach does that, especially at West Ham. Um, so thank you. And uh, listen, I appreciate you coming on and having a chat with me for the last half hour. I know the people watching it right now have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's rare that we get an insight into a Premier League club these days, a little peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, so for you coming on and being so candid, I appreciate it. Um, but Mark, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, nice speaking to you. All the very best. And best of luck with everything in the future. And if you guys at home have enjoyed this interview, please do drop a like on the video by clicking thumbs up, subscribe to your channel, chat. And whilst Mark will be here tomorrow, I will be. I'll catch you then. Mm -hmm.